Good afternoon, everyone. Very uh, pleased to be here to have this opportunity to talk to you today about the Duke Lemur Center's conservation program in Madagascar. But what I'd like to start off with is, is telling you a little bit about the country of Madagascar, giving you a bit of background, and it will all mean a lot more. Madagascar, of course, is off the southeast coast of Africa. Um, but surprisingly to many people, it's quite a large island. It's the fourth largest island in the world. It's about the size of California. But of course, it hasn't always been there. It's, um, it began pulling away from the continent of Africa about 100 million years ago. Then what we know today is India pulled away from Madagascar and sailed across the Indian Ocean. And uh, Madagascar remained completely isolated for somewhere around 80 million years. So why is that important? Obviously, it's important because it means that, that evolution took place there in, in complete isolation for millions and millions of years. And not only as a result of that, of course, you get many endemic species, unique species, uh, probably about 80%, if you were to put plants and animals together, 80% of the species in Madagascar are unique to Madagascar. They don't exist anywhere else in the world. But not only do you get endemic species island-wide, but different climate zones in, on the island uh, also have different unique species. Everything from rainforest on the east coast, where you get uh, three meters of rain a year, spiny desert in the, in the south, to uh, the deciduous forest in the west that's dominated by baobabs, the area in the central plateau part of the country, it can be prairie, can be savanna, sometimes it's uh, forested. And then you get these unique habitats in certain parts of the country, small areas like uh, Ishalu, for example, National Park, which is where these images come from, which is Bismarckia palm savanna. And, and then you get areas like the uplifted limestone karst massif, which was ocean bed at one time and over the millions of years was uplifted and then er eroded into these incredibly unique formations. But in each and every one of these sites you get, of course, um, flora and fauna that is absolutely unique to those different areas. So in addition to, to endemic species in Madagascar, you get really high diversity in, in certain groups. Baobabs, for example, there are eight species of baobabs worldwide. Six of those species come from Madagascar. There are three times the number of species of palms in Madagascar as there are in the entire African continent. Two-thirds of the world's chameleons come from Madagascar. And uh, of course, lemurs come only from Madagascar, with the exception of a couple of species that, that come from the nearby Comoro Islands. Um, the lemurs are a fascinating story in and of themselves. Ancestral lemurs existed 60 million years ago, somehow got across to Madagascar then, and evolved into the 100 plus species that we know today, everything from the nocturnal mouse lemur that eats insects to fruit eaters to lemurs that eat leaves and flowers and nectar and seed, terrestrial lemurs, um, even lemurs that are like little pandas and eat nothing but, but bamboo. But all these species of animals and plants um, are, are quite endangered right now. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But if you look at these images of, of the disappearance of the eastern rainforest, you can see that by 2029, the situation is looking pretty bleak. Lots of fragmented forest. So uh, why is that? And uh, since man arrived in Madagascar, which has been about 2,000 years ago, uh, subsistence agriculture has, has been the way that, the cultural way that people raised rice, manioc, 
other agricultural products. There are other causes of deforestation in Madagascar. I don't really have time to get into them today. But in any case, the slash and burn subsistence agriculture known as TAVI is really by far the most important reason for deforestation in Madagascar. Um, ta slash and burn is, is pretty much what you know it to be, cutting the vegetation, letting it dry, burning it. The ash produces a, a quick shot of nitrogen in the soil. Crops can be planted one year on it, and then people move on. Works fine at low population densities, but at higher population density, the, the whole system just breaks down. Uh, so you get a, a, a progression of, of primary forests to areas of degra degradation to, in the end, uh, land that's totally destroyed totally useless for animals or human beings and would take a thousand years to recover um, if it could ever recover at all to a natural state. And so because of this, um, this environmental degradation, 17 species of lemurs that we know of have become extinct since man has been arrived or since man arrived in Madagascar. Uh, some really unique lemurs, one species, Megalatopus, is as large as a female gorilla. And other animals as well, like the Epiornis, also known as the elephant bird that was 10 feet tall, pygmy hippos, uh, a whole variety of animals, just as often happens in isl island settings when humans arrive. Um, so the Duke Lemur Center, as um, as a mission, as objectives, you, you know, of course, that we're a research center. So research is, is one of our most important objectives. Education is also an important objective. But also very important to us is conservation in Madagascar. Uh, and we've been involved in conservation in Madagascar for 25 years. And we're now focusing in an area in the northeast called the Sava region. And the Sava region uh, encompasses a couple of very important protected areas, Marajeji National Park and Anjanahari Bay Sud Special Reserve. Uh, it was one of the reasons that we selected this area to, to work in. Um, and our conservation strategy that has developed over 25 years is very much a multifaceted and community-based uh, technique or strategy, as you'll see as, as I go through the slides. But the Sava region um, is a very unique region, even in Madagascar. It goes from the coastal areas, from sea level, all the way up to 2,000 meter peaks, and includes, of course, all the forested areas at different um, altitudinal gradients with the flora and fauna that that includes. So it's it's, um, from a biological sense, it's an extremely important area of Madagascar with relatively large amount of forest left uh, compared to other regions of Madagascar. The flagship species of lemur there would be the silky shafak, but there are other lemurs, of course, there as well, that lemur species that are found up and down the East Coast rainforest and the birds as well but also people and a growing population in this region. And a lot of that population is, is centered in the uh, Andapa Basin. And it's an excellent rice growing area, the Andapa Basin, but they're running out of space. And people are moving up the hillsides, practicing slash and burn on the hillsides and, and other areas. So we the Lemur Center, we have a, a, a team on the ground in the Sava region operating the project. It's an American, Argentinian, Malagasy team, and uh, they're specialists in conservation and are doing what they can to protect uh, the Sava region. And I'm going to go very quickly through our different components or activities in the region. Environmental education is the, is the activity that's the most important to us that we started with. We have a lot of experience with, with environmental education. 
teacher training, training primary school teachers how to teach environmental education, guided school, uh, guided tours in the protected areas, introducing school children to primary rainforest, reforestation. We collaborate with a, a Belgian organization called Grand de Vie. Um, fish farming, not one you would think of that immediately comes to mind, but, but it's the objective is to give people an alternative to bush meat, which there's a problem with in the area, people hunting lemurs. Uh, we're approaching fish farming a little bit differently than the traditional methods. We're using uh, a native species of freshwater fish, paratilapia, and in our agreements with villagers, a certain percentage of the fish that are harvested from the ponds are actually released in nearby rivers to try to get the local populations, which are extinct or nearly extinct, to get those population of native fish started again. Um, yam, raising yams as, a, as an alternative crop to slash and burn rice. We support um, fuel efficient stoves which use 50% of the wood or charcoal that a traditional stove or fire pit would use, but they have additional vi uh, advantages of both from a health perspective in terms of air quality and smoke in the kitchens, but also uh, have economic benefits. We're, we're even involved in support of, of family planning. We're not involved in it ourselves. We support and facilitate an NGO, international NGO, uh, known as Marie Stopes, who works in the area already. The village, the response of, of women in the villages has been enormous. It gives um, women reproductive choices, which they didn't have in the past. We're collaborating with Madagascar National Parks, it's a, it's a government department that has very little money to work with, and we try to empower them by buying equipment, helping them delineate the boundaries of the protected areas and uh, activities like that. And of course, we're involved in research. There's still much that's not known about the, uh, about the Sava region, so uh, we have lemur research and other ecological research going on in the area. We do have Duke connections. Uh, we have Duke engaged students that come and work with us. We've had for the past two years, two students work with us. And this summer, we'll have two more students that are gonna be working with us. We worked with the Nicholas School, had students come do projects with us. This summer, uh, Duke Global Health Initiative will be sending a team or a team will come, a Bass Connections team that we'll be working with, facilitating, and hopefully soon we'll have a collaboration going with the, the Fuqua School of Business. Um, as you see, a lot of uh, what we do is community-based. It's working with people. It's not what, what a lot of people envision is true conservation work, but we found that it is the way to do sustainable conservation, conservation that will last after we're not there in the years to come. Uh, we've learned from our experience that you have to convince people, the local people, that it's in their own interest to protect their forest. If you don't, um, you've not created something that's really sustainable. But to move away from, from Madagascar a little bit, um, loss of forest, loss of biodiversity is not a problem that's unique to Madagascar. It's not a problem that's even unique to developing countries. There are 8.7 million eukaryotic species, plants and animals in the world, many of them that we don't even know that have not even been classified yet or described. Uh, extinction before humans arrived on the scene was progressing at about five to ten species extinction per year. Now we have extinction rates of a dozen extinction species extinctions per day. The, the extinction rates are a thousand times faster now um, than they were before humans were on the scene. 
So we're actually in the sixth great extinction event that the planet has known. Uh, if poaching of African elephants and rhinos goes on at the same rate that it is now, those two species uh, are, will be extinct in two decades. 20 years, they'll be gone. We lose a uh, tropical forest the size of the state of New York every single year. Um, on and on, we're just, we're losing our, our biodiversity at an alarming rate. Is it important? Yes, it's important. Do we understand it completely? No, we don't, by a long shot. Species are interconnected very often when one species goes extinct, it affects other species. Pollinators need plants. Plants need pollinators and seed dispersers. Predators need prey. Um, E.O. Wilson and other conservation biologists have been trying to warn us about this for years, if not decades. It's a very serious problem, and we just don't really have an idea when do we get to the point of ecosystem collapse? We need biodiversity for ecosystem resiliency, for nature to recover. Um, so uh, I, we're building energy here, so I don't want to build gloom and doom. Conservation uh, biologists were accused of building gloom and doom uh, very often. But uh, what I would like to, to, to leave you with is I would like to challenge you, um, to encourage you to learn more about uh, biodiversity loss, to become proactive, to talk to your friends, and to, to try to contribute to this enormous problem that we have. We owe it to our, uh, to our planet, and we owe it to the next generation. Thank you very much.